Thank you to everyone who is in the audience. Um, on behalf of the Kenyon Review, we are very happy that you are here and spending the evening with us. I'm Elizabeth Dark. I'm Associate Director of Programs. And I'm joined on the screen right now by our two authors, Victoria Chang and Jakira Diaz. Ira Zagrangrung, who is a uh, professor at the Kenyon College and his Thomas Shear is helping us uh, by co-sponsoring this event. And then we also have Michaela Connolly and Lily Beeson Norwitz on the screen as well. These are Kenyon College students who also serve as Kenyon Review Associates. And they are going to be helping us with the uh, introductions and in, in the Q&A today. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things and I'm actually gonna share my screen, um, which I don't tend to like to do, but everything I want you to know is here. Um, <clears throat> This is the Kenyon Review webpage, and here you see our two readers for the evening. Um, and uh, there's so much available to you here, but I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of things specifically. Under events, uh, this link will take you to our reading series page, which uh, will show you all the other events that we have on our calendar for the year. Uh, and then specifically, In My Time, A Narrative Space is um, an offering that we are um, seeing right now, it is through In My Time that we bring this event to you tonight. And um, I wanna show you a little bit of what that is. Um, if you go down, can you all see this? Mm -hmm. I, yes, okay. Yes. Um, if you go down, you will see that we have created some collections and we actually have two more that will uh, roll out when the turn of the year occurs. Uh, and it's where our um, instructors, or sorry, our um, uh, professors and some of our editors have put together for us collections and those collections are available if you click here in PDF format and then we have some associates who have put together resources to uh, walk you through those collections if you would like to take any of the stories and just sort of go a little further in um, sort of exploring the themes the topics writing prompts that kind of thing and then here you notice we have uh, this reading, which you, where you are now. We also have Sakina Hoffler coming December 7th, and you can register for that here. Uh, and then if you go to our reading series page, you will find our bookshop. And in our bookshop, you can purchase the books uh, by Victoria and Jakira, as well as other people that have been in our reading series recently. And I'm gonna go back and show you if you would like to donate to the Kenyon Review, you can go to this screen to make a donation. Um, we appreciate that at any time. Um, but at this point, I'm going to disappear. I'm going to take some more people off the screen and I'm going to let Lily introduce Jakira. Uh, tonight, it is with great pleasure and honor to introduce Jakira Diaz author of Ordinary Girls, a memoir, and I Am Deliberate, which is her forthcoming novel. A stunning and bold first memoir, Ordinary Girls, illustrates the hardships and despairs of Diaz's coming of age in a fraught family environment in Puerto Rico in Miami Beach. Diaz paints an unflinchingly honest and powerful portrait of what it means to take pride in your womanhood and cultural identity and how to navigate the treacherous and murky waters of your own trauma and resilience. Ordinary Girls has received a Whiting Award in nonfiction, a Florida Book Awards gold medal, was a Lum Lombada Literary Award finalist and a Barnes and Noble Discover Prize finalist and was lauded as one of the most anticipated books in 2019. Meanwhile, her second book, I'm Deliberate, is forthcoming from Algonquin Books. Uh, Diaz's work can also be found in Time Magazine, The Southern Review, The Fader, The Best American Essays, editions 2016 to 2019, and many other publications. She is currently a visiting professor at the University, University of Wisconsin-Madison and is an editor at the Kenyon Review. When I read Ghosts from the Kenyon Review's In My Time, um, A Narrative Space, Diaz's words gripped me until the ending and lingered with me long after. In one of my English classes at Kenyon, we are learning about how the ghostly and, amb and ambivalent figures situate themselves within the undead's lives. The ghosts and ghosts serve as a reminder as to what happens when our grief haunts us in the wake of so much suffering and death. However, in processing our own, our own personal grief, 
we can begin to mend what has shattered within us. Our wounds will become scarred flesh with time. With that, I am pleased to welcome Shakira Diaz. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, that was so kind and so lovely. I'm happy to be here reading with you all and having a conversation afterward and especially humbled um, to be reading with Victoria Tang, whose work, um, whose poetry I'm a huge fan of. And um, so I decided to read something different, um, not fiction, nothing like ghosts. Um, I'm gonna be reading though from a chapter in Ordinary Girls called Girls Monsters. Um, for those of you who read the book, you kind of know that I'm obsessed with monsters. Um, whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction, I always, I'm always thinking about them. Um, for me, it tends to be something that's um, cultural in a way that we, Puerto Ricans are always telling stories and we're always thinking about our dead and, and our dead kind of live with us. Our ghosts are not necessarily just haunting us, but they kind of tend to be part of our everyday lives. Um, and I wanted to look at monsters and monstrosity kind of as a lens for this idea, for the way that girls, especially black and brown girls are perceived. Um, and so I'm gonna be reading from the second half of Girls Monsters. The spring China turned 15, we were herded into a banquet hall for her quinces, all of us in our magenta ball gowns, elbow length gloves, hair pinned up in elaborate twists, lips painted red. We walked down the aisle, our dance partners in their black tuxedos, magenta bow ties to match our skirts. As tiempo de vas blared from the speakers, we swayed to the music like we were in some old movie, counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, in our heads with the rhythm of the music, just like Gina's tia had taught us, the boys' hands at our waists, our palms sweaty in our tacky-ass gloves. We winked at each other from across the room, stuck our tongues out when we caught Gina's eye, giggling while her family watched from their extravagantly decorated tables. We twirled and twirled in our wide skirts, and when the song finished, we kept dancing. Another song and another and another, all of us smiling and sweaty and breathless, overcome with too much Keith sweat and boys to men, too much freak me and rub you the right way. We stopped caring about how anybody saw us, what they might think. After the boys had left the dance floor, after the pictures and the cutting of the cake, after all of us changed out of our magenta ball gowns and into little black dresses we'd picked out for ourselves, after we let our hair down and kicked off those ridiculous heels, we went back out on the dance floor, just the girls hanging on to each other. We sang along to every song, our cheeks flushed, our curls sticking to our foreheads, the backs of our necks, our shoulders and backs glistening, and we stopped thinking about the real world, our real world problems, who was on house arrest, whose brother had just gotten a 10-year sentence for racketeering, whose parents were living paycheck to paycheck. We felt the music vibrating through our bodies, fingers to toes, the beats hammering on our chests, filling us. We were beaming, we were breath and rhythm, laughing and laughing in each other's arms. And for a while, as the world was spinning, blue and red and yellow lights flashing all across the banquet hall, I looked around at us, at my girls, round faces covered in their mother's makeup, how we would be how we would all be in high school in a few short months. And all I could see which how, was how much I loved them, how much I loved us. I didn't know it yet, none of us did, but it would be these hood girls, these ordinary girls who would save me. The fall after Chinas Quinces, the year we started high school, Shorty and I became friends. We'd known each other before, met when some friends and I were planning to fight some other Nautilus girls, a ridiculous one-minute roll on the sidewalk that ended with one of the girls having a seizure in front of Hunan Chinese restaurants, the rest of us scrambling in 10 different directions when the cop cars pulled up, lights flashing. 
Shorty turned out to be one of my closest friends, even though we hadn't known each other long. She'd moved on from Chicago just a year before. We fell into an easy friendship, growing our hair long, dressing alike. She was small with doe eyes and a dash of freckles across her nose, and she was always, always smiling. That fall, that year, she was one of the few people I went to with my fears, my dreams, my anger. In her first period music class, advanced chorus, we got split into separate sections, Shorty with the sopranos and me with the altos. Every morning we'd walk in, sit together, talk shit about some of the other alto girls, the girlfriend of some dude Shorty had a crush on, the sister of a boy who'd snitched on me while I was skipping until Dr. Martin walked in and sent me on my way back to the altos. From my spot in the second row, I watched Shorty standing directly across from me in the semicircle, smiling, her eyes wide. It killed me that I wasn't a soprano, that I couldn't reach those high ass notes like Shorty, but also that I couldn't sing next to her, that we never got to be side by side as we tried to sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks singing Billy Joel's You May Be Right, or when we changed the lyrics to Boys to Men's End of the Road to something nasty, or when we danced and clapped like a gospel choir while we sang Oh Happy Day. I was secretly obsessed with Sister Act 2 back in the habit and crushing hard on Lauren Hill, so I didn't even mind singing about Jesus. That winter, we watched New York undercover on group phone calls, Boogie and China and Flaca and Shorty and me, all of us on the party line, screaming at the TV when Malik Yoba, Michael De Lorenzo, and Lauren Velez took off down the street chasing some drug dealer. We cut pictures of Jodeci and Boys to Men and Tupac from magazines, taped them on the covers of our notebooks. We watched Janet and Pac fall in love in poetic justice, and we all wanted to be Janet. Scribbling poems on the margins of our textbooks, strutting into school in baggy jeans and combat boots. We watched the X-Files, imagined ourselves solving paranormal mysteries, having alien babies turning into monsters. And then we speculated about the size of Mulder's dick. We felt the warmth of that place between our legs, and there was nothing monstrous or strange about it. That winter, we measured out our life in songs, singing as we put on eyeliner in front of the mirror, as we passed each other in the halls at school, as we waited for the bus across from the park. We belted out Mariah's version of I'll Be There in Chino's mother's car on the way to a sleepover. We broke into fits of spontaneous booty shaking as we walked along West Avenue when a car drove by blasting Shake What Your Mama Gave Ya as we rode the escalator in Aventura Mall. We choreographed dances to Pop That Pussy and the Uncle Al song at Chino's house. We knew all the lyrics to every single DJ Uncle Al song. Mix it up and holes in this house and bass is going to blow your mind. Uncle Al, who was known all over Miami for promoting nonviolence and peace in the hood, but was shot and killed outside his house in Alapada. We dogged each other to it's your birthday while hanging from the monkey bars, lightning in our limbs, while drinking orange sodas at Miami subs, while tagging the handball courts everywhere, Boogie, China, Flaca, Shorty, Jackie. That spring, we paid Tecatos at 7-Eleven to get us bottles of strawberry Cisco, took the bus to Bayside, got on the party boat, danced and danced and danced with older boys, handed them our phone numbers at the end of the night, we rode to the all ages clubs, Pack Jam and Sugar Hill and Bootleggers, where they sold no alcohol, but everybody smoked weed. We passed that blunt across the dance floor, all of us sweaty and smiling, and on stage, older girls, dusted with baby powder, shook and shook their asses, flashing us their tits, all the girls booing, all the boys screaming, cheering, fists in the air. We smiled at each other nervously, recognizing some of the girls we knew from school. Two years ahead of us, three years ahead of us, our friend's cousin, a girl my brother dated once. And one day that winter, we would hear about one of those girls, see her face on the news about how she and her best friends were found floating in Biscayne Bay, strangled 
tied together. There are school pictures all over our TVs for days, for weeks. Their story on the front page of the Sun Sentinel with the headline, they were inseparable friends and they were slain together. We would remember their dancing, speculate about the who, the how, the why, we would talk about how they were so young, had so much life left to live, as if we knew anything about life and living it. We knew nothing but what eyes could see. That summer, on the last day of school, me and Shorty cut out after lunch, headed to the beach for National Skip Day, the two of us in Daisy Dukes and Chancletas, our curly hair wild and frizzy and sun-streaked at the South Point Pier, high school kids in bathing suits and shades, seeing each other's bodies for the first time, blasting bone thugs and harmonies, thuggish, shruggish bone on their radios, catcalling girls across the way. Then, when a fight broke out, one dude holding the other underwater, arms swinging wildly, we ran toward the shore to see it. When he was finally able to get free, none of us saw it coming. The walk back to his car, the loaded gun pulled from his glove box. How we lost each other in the madness, Shorty running down the shoreline and me heading for the water. The bodies on the sand, all of us scrambling away from the gunfire. Later that night, we would watch ourselves on the news, all those teenagers loose on the beach, on the pier, no parents anywhere, the faraway spray of white caps breaking. Just weeks later, me and Shorty were back on the beach, knocking back old E with some dudes we just met. The sun on our faces, bikinis under oversized t-shirts. We walked a couple blocks to their place. And once we were there, 15 and 16, and in a stranger's apartment, DJ Plagero's underground on the radio, it was so clear, so easy to see how they separated us, knew exactly what to say. Shorty in the bathroom, me in the living room, the bottle half empty on the floor. How I never thought to ask how old he was, old enough to buy alcohol, to have his own apartment. How he ripped my bathing suits, the banging on the bathroom door, his hand over my mouth, the music so loud. How I pushed back, kicking, reaching for the ashtray, the remote, anything, until finally the bottle. And I was Shorty and Shorty was me and we were every girl. We had not been alone. All of us in that apartment, in that bathroom, all of us breathing alive, lightning in our limbs, banging on that door for minutes, hours, a lifetime. And for a moment, I thought it was possible that I could lose her, that I could be one of those girls. It was the same the next summer and the summer after that. We went right back to drinking, smoking, fighting, dancing, 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 running away. We wanted to be seen, finally, to exist in the lives we'd mapped out for ourselves. We wanted more than noise. We wanted everything. We were ordinary girls, but we would have given anything to be monsters. We weren't creatures or aliens or women in disguise, but girls. We were girls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakira. That was um, incredible. Um, hi, my name is Michaela Connolly. Okay. Um, as I was saying, I'm a sophomore at Kenyon College. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Victoria Chang, um, a writer and editor from Detroit, Michigan. She has studied at Harvard University and Stanford University and has received an MFA from the Warren Wilson MFA program for writers, as well as a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2017. In addition to several children's books, Chang has published four collections of poetry, including The Boss in 2013 and Barbie Chang in 2017. Her most recent release, Obit, was longlisted for the 2020 National Book Award in Poetry and explores grief in an unconventional way. An alternative to elegies, each poem is in the form of a newspaper obituary, grieving people such as Chang's late mother, as well as the more abstract like language and the future. Rather than immortalizing the dead, Obed expresses loss as a testament for the living. I read Obed earlier this semester in Professor Grace's advanced poetry class, and I'm not exaggerating when I say it truly changed my perception on how we write about grief. Loss is a topic I personally explore a lot in my own writing, and Obed showed me there are so many things we lose with our loved ones we rarely stop to reflect on. 
that our poems on grief don't always have to be some tragic elegy, but instead can be a powerful reflection on how we live with and move forward after such loss. Please welcome Victoria Chang. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I just wanna thank Nicole Dutton for the um, invitation, David Lynn, David Baker, Elizabeth Dark, Michaela and Lily, thanks so much for doing the hard work of reading and writing the introductions and delivering them really beautifully. And it's also a gift to read with uh, Jakira. Um, you know, today is actually um, Craig, the poet Craig Arnold's birthday. And so I don't know why I know that. I just, it, you know, sometimes pops up and today and sort of whose birthday it is today. And so I'm just gonna start by reading a poem by, by Craig the late poet Craig Arnold. And this is actually one of my favorite poems of his. It's called Very Large Moth. Your first thought when the light snaps on and the black wings clatter about the kitchen is a bat. The clear part of your mind considers rabies. The other part does not consider, knows only to startle and cower away from the slap of its wings. Though it is soon clearly not a bat, but a moth and harmless. Still, you are shy of it. It clings to the hood of the stove, not black, but brown. Its orange eyes sparkle like televisions. Its leg joints are large enough to count. How could you kill it? Where would you hide the body? A creature so solid must have room for a soul. And if this is so, why not in a creature half its size or half its size again, and so on, down to the ants? Clearly, it must be saved, caught in a shopping bag and rushed to the front door, afraid to crush it, feeling the plastic rattle loosened into the night air. It batters the porch light, throwing fitful shadows around the landing. That was a really big moth, is all you can say to the doorman, who has watched your whole performance with a smile, the half compassion and half horror we feel for the creatures we want not to hurt and prefer not to touch. That was published in poetry in 2013. It's hard to read, it's um, no punctuation and there are all these breaks in between the, uh, the lines themselves. Um, so I'm just gonna read a few poems today um, and I'll, I'll start with a poem from my book, prior book, R.B. Chang. And it's just a, an epistolary poem. So it's a letter poem in the back of the book. It's called Dear P. Someone will love you. Many will love you. Many will brother you. Some of these loves will bother you. Some will leave you. One might haunt you, hunt you in your sleep, make you weep the tearless kind of weep, the kind of weep that drowns your organs slowly. There are little oars in your body, little boats, Grab onto them and row and row. Someone will tell you no, but you won't know he is right until you have already wrung your own heart dry, your hands dripping knives, until you have already reached your hands into his body and put them through his heart. Love is the only thing that is not an argument. So I will... Um, Maybe just to give you a two second introduction to these poems, um, which didn't start out as poems. So my, my mom just, you know, some information, basic information that you may or may not need to know, but passed away in 2015 of pulmonary fibrosis. And it's, um, it's, a, it's kind of a brutal disease. I've heard it um, be called sort of worse than, than cancer. I, I cannot claim to say whether that's true or not, but it is pretty brutal. Um, and your, your lungs sort of harden and you, you gradually suffocate to death. And then my dad, had a stroke about 12 years ago now, he's still alive, um, but, but uh, doesn't, doesn't really understand anything. So um, I was very much aware of the, the history and, of, and the, the beauty of all the elegies that had been written in the past, you know, Walt Whitman, one of my favorite elegies. Um, I just didn't really feel like I could contribute to that literature in a way that would be helpful or useful to myself or anyone else really. And so um, I decided not to intentionally write about my mother's passing or her sickness until I heard um, some people on NPR talking about a documentary on obituary writers. And it was the documentary, I haven't watched it, but it's called Obit. And I don't know, something about that word um, just sort of made me start writing these uh, obituaries where everything dies. And I think the first one is literally the first one 
that I wrote in, uh, the, in the book, it's my, front, my Father's Frontal Lobe. So I'll just read a few of these. And um, this one is called Memory. Memory died August 3rd, 2015. The death was not sudden, but slowly over a decade. I wonder if when people die, they hear a bell or if they taste something sweet or if they feel a knife cutting them in half, dragging through the flesh like sheet cake. The caretaker who witnessed my mother's death quit. She holds the memory and images and now they are gone. For the rest of her life, the memories are hers. She said my mother couldn't breathe, then took her last breath 20 seconds later. The way I have imagined a kiss with many men I have never kissed. My memory of my mother's death can't be a memory, but is an imagination. Each time the wind blows, leaves unfurl a little differently. This one's called Friendships. Friendships died June 24th, 2009, once beloved, but not consistently beloved. The mirror won the battle. I am now imprisoned in the mirror, all myself spread out like a deck of cards. It's true, the grieving speak a different language. I am separated from my friends by gauze. I'll drive myself to my own house for the party. I will make small talk with myself, spill a drink on myself. When it's over, I will drive myself back to my own house. My conversations with other parents about children pass me on the way up the staircase and repeat on the way down. Before my mother's death, I sat anywhere. Now I look for the image of the empty chair near the image of the empty table. An image is a kind of distance. An image of me sits down. Depression is a glove over the heart. Depression is an image of a glove over the image of a heart. And um, so my, I don't know if anyone has dentures or knows someone with dentures, but my mother had dentures and um, really awful teeth, which I inherited. I have really awful teeth as well. Um, but back in the day where my mom is from, they didn't have good dental care. So um, it's sort of like this spooky thing where teeth are always everywhere. And so um, cups of teeth soaking in various fizzy things and there are smells to it as well. So this one's called My Mother's Teeth. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease, once again on August 3rd, 2015. The fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. So um, I wrote a whole bunch of these, and um, actually I think I wrote maybe 75 or 80 of these, and then I stopped um, abruptly, not sure why, but I uh, started writing sonnets and various other um, formal poems, and um, I put them in the back of this manuscript and one of my friends, a really good friend of mine, just basically said, these are all terrible, take them all out. Um, but these tankas that you wrote, these um, Japanese sort of syllabic poems that are five, um, seven, five, seven, seven, 31 syllables. He liked them and he said, spread them out through the manuscript. And these are, I guess, um, you know, maybe looking back their their conversations with other children or children in general or my own children. And I'll just, and they're in pairs. Um, so I'll read four of them, so two pair. I tell my children that hope is like a blue skirt. It can twirl and twirl, that men like to open it, take it apart and wound it. 
I tell my children that sometimes I too can hope, that sometimes nothing moves but my love for someone and the light from the dead star. And these are actually, I, I mentioned this in another reading I just did, that these are actually really hard to write because you, you kind of fall in love with some of the words and things that you have selected. And then unfortunately you're, uh, you have an extra syllable or your syllable short and then you just start all over. Here are two more. Do you see the tree? Its secrets grow as lemons. Sometimes I pretend I love my children more than words. No one knows this but words. My children, children, today my hands are dreaming as they touch your hair. Your hair turns into winter. When I die, your hair will snow. And I guess just read a few more of these obits. Um, this one is called Grief. Grief as I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning, I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains, but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The text kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. Um, I'll read two more of these obits and then I'll read a tanka at the end. So I'll read this poem. This one is actually published in the Kenyan Review. Um, it's uh, it's called The Clock. And um, I was listening um, to NPR another day and they were talking to someone who has Alzheimer's and um, he was trying to explain to <laughs> someone that was being interviewed, or he was being interviewed, um, uh, how to read a clock. The clock died on June 24, 24, 2009, and it was untimely. How many times my father has failed the clock test? Once I heard a scientist with Alzheimer's on the radio trying to figure out why he could no longer draw a clock. It had to do with the superposition of three types. The hours represented by one to 12, the minutes where one no longer represents one, but five, and a two now represents 10, then the second hand that measures one to 60. I sat at the stoplight and thought of the clock, its perfect circle and its superpositions, all the layers of complication on a plane of thought. Yet the healthy read the clock in one single instant without a second thought. I think about my father and his lack of first thoughts, how every thought is a second or third or fourth thought, unable to locate the first, most important thought. I wonder about the man on the radio and how far his brain has degenerated since. Marvel at how far brains allow language to wander without looking back, but knowing where the peer is. If you unfold an origami swan and flatten the paper, is the paper sad because it has seen the shape of the swan or does it aspire toward flatness, a life without creases? My father is the paper. He remembers the swan, but can't name it. He no longer knows the paper swan represents an animal swan. His brain is the water the animal swan once swam in, holds everything, but when thawed, all the fish disappear. Most of the words we say have something to do with fish. And when they're gone, they're gone. Um, I'll read the penultimate poem in the book and it is uh, actually a prompt. So from the editor at terrain.org, um, 
you know, saw, saw a few of these opiates out in the world. And they do this really great series called the Dear America series and their epistolary essays, poems, letters, whatever. Uh, he asked me to write a poem um, to America in the obituary form. And I, I, I initially said no, because I'm terrible at writing towards prompts that other people give me. Um, but then I thought, I don't know when I decided to try it. So the only thing you need to know is that um, it uh, re references the Marjorie Stoneman High School in Florida where the shooting occurred. America died on February 14, 2018, and my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children holds telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with a hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. And I'll just read one more. It's the last um, poem in the book and there are two little tankas together. I'm ready to admit I love my children. To admit this is to admit that they will die, die. No one knows this but words. My children, children, this poem will not end because I'm trying to end this poem with hope, hope, hope. See how the mouth stays open? Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to get my camera back on, but it's going to take me a second. Meanwhile, I can get other people on. Um, to those in the audience, uh, I'm going to point you to the um, Q&A section in the chat. Uh, and that is where if you have a question, uh, I would ask you to place it. Um, and I'm going to be filtering those questions to Jakira and Victoria uh, at this time. Um, but I actually have a question uh, I'd like to start us with. Um, and it actually has to do with questions. <laughs> um, you know, we're going on many, many months of these virtual events, uh, virtual readings, uh, virtual gatherings. Uh, and at the same time, we have these, these uh, huge topics um, floating around in our minds. And I was wondering if uh, you all, as you have, as you have done events, um, has the question changed? Have, have the types of questions changed um, in this format or in this period from what, from what you were being asked before? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> um, I feel like that it depends a lot on what the kind of events, because I've done some events for book festivals and the questions are very much focused on what happens in the book. And then there are questions um, with writing programs that have everything to do with craft. And um, I feel like the questions in the very beginning of this um, were more focused about on what do we do now? <laughs> Who are you reading? Like, what can I do? Um, but, but I feel like we've come to a point where we've gotten used to these events and we're just now learning that we can get a lot more out of them and using, using that time and using the space and in ways that we weren't doing back in March and April. Yeah, I mean, I feel like 
it's a tone thing, if that makes sense. So, you know, like sometimes I'll read a poem and I ha I'll have no idea what it's saying or its subject matter is, but I'll have a, a mood or a feeling from it. And I, I just sort of call those poems like tone poems. Um, I feel like the tone of, of readings has, you know, the tone has changed in that you can sort of feel people have changed, you know, initially, I we were just talking about this Elizabeth earlier. It's like in January and February, everybody was more panicked and um, it kind of felt like people were sure what was happening. Now I feel like people have sort of, now everyone has a clear understanding of what's happening. And I think, um, you know, I think, I feel like people are more comfortable sort of embracing these new ways that we're doing things. And so there's a, I feel like people are getting technologically more savvy and I feel like um, everyone's just more comfortable, you know, just in this sort of space. And so I feel people, like people are more relaxed, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't know if the questions have changed at all, but yeah, like, like Jakira saying, it just depends on the, the audience and what people, you know, like sometimes it's all about, you know, the writing process and writing other times it's, it's, I don't know, if it, people have really asked questions about kind of like how you're feeling about the pandemic or things like that um, too much anyway, because I don't know if anyone like it uses these spaces to, to have those conversations, but I, I feel like people are, are um, you know, the anxieties, you can feel the anxieties a lot. And, and during around the election time, you could feel those anxieties too. So it just depends on what's around us. And we're all so much connected in ways that we weren't before in terms of the news and the access to immediate information that you can feel all of those things um, depending on, you know, what's happening in the macro sort of world. Yeah, I, I also wanted to add that I feel like my questions have changed, like the questions I'm asking myself as an artist, as a writer, um, the way that I'm thinking about work has changed a lot. Um, especially the way that I'm thinking about nonfiction as, you know, something like what is true. I think I'm thinking of nonfiction more as a place to speculate and to think about alternate futures and alternate histories. Yeah, I can see, I can see how that would change. Yeah, just your process. Um, some questions are coming in from the audience and I will ask one of them and I'll, I'll let the other people on the screen, Ira, Michaela, Lily, I'll let you know. Um, one of you can go after I ask this next one. Um, this is from Tara in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, she says, thank you for two fantastic readings. My question is about the importance of form in your work. Are you guided by writing in set forms or do you typically arrive at a final form during the redrafting process? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's a good answer. For me, it depends one on what the what I'm working on, and I think um, I say this a lot. I always say, like, literally lean into whatever paper you're working on your manuscript and ask it what it wants to look like. Sometimes I write in a composition notebook and just go straight from left to right. And then it, the palms find their, or whatever they are, find their vessels later. Um, other times with the book Ovid, um, I think I knew when the, with the very first line I wrote that they may take a shape of an obituary, but I, I, they weren't shaped in obituaries. Like it was only until they made it onto the computer that then I started messing around with the, the form. And then the form became very precise at the end. It's like, it had to be, you know, one and a half spacing between the lines. It had to be, um, you know, 1.8 on the right and two on the left or whatever I start. It just had to be that perfect, um, you know, spacing between and sans serif fonts and things like that. But I think it just depends on, on whatever it is that you're working on. And they, you know, it's like your palms talk to you. I feel like, um, and so I think it's like just asking them wh what might work for them at a certain time. And I think a lot of different things could work for one kind of poem too. So I think that for me, it just depends. Um, answer, answering a little more seriously, I, I agree with everything Victoria just said. For me, I don't think I necessarily know um, when I start a piece, I think if I know the form, um, then I have to have a reason for it. Like, I feel like the form 
can be limiting or can or it can be uh, you know restrictive in a way that's positive that that forces you to think of writing um differently um but I don't necessarily know when I you know show up to the page whether or not I you know it's going to take one form or another I think I I allow myself room to experiment and to change and to play with things and to come back and re-envision the work and change a form if I need to um and other times I feel like I need to stick to a form just because I it sounds really cool and the piece fails and that's okay because I might get something else from from that piece that I'll use later I have a question for the both of you. Um, so I was wondering uh, how you find other entryways to difficult material, like, you know, um, a lot of your poem, Victoria, grief, um, death, and, and, and uh, with Jakira, you know, sexuality, violence, you know, um, and, you know, I'm teaching a beginning nonfiction course this semester, and we're always trying to say, like, how do we, how do we find different angles into really loaded tough material so are, are there ways that you um that you guys do this any tips <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean i feel like for poetry so much of poetry um comes out of complication and trauma and tension anyway um and i feel like that um you know for for students sometimes i feel like accessing that can be triggering and difficult. And so sometimes that's the work that needs to be done almost before entering a page. And sometimes I'll just tell people just to free write, you know, to start in a composition notebook at the very left-hand corner and just start just writing things. Um, and you can even write things like, I do not want to do this right now and just keep going until you hit the bottom right hand corner and try and access some of those more that some of that more sort of repressed or difficult emotions that you might feel or ex life experiences that you may have and and sort of letting go of this idea of I'm writing about difficult things or I'm just sort of um, you know just journaling and jotting things down can be a way to enter into that that space um, but yeah I mean I think it can be triggering and difficult and then every time you revise something that's emotionally trying you know you might find yourself you know intentionally sort of harming yourself again and it's it's not necessarily a particularly enjoyable process um, but if you're thinking about making art you know and you're actually creating a sculpture or doing something like that it feels like it could be um, worth it in the end you know but it's definitely not it's not meant to be easy if that makes sense. Um, thank you for that, for that answer, uh, Victoria. I don't necessarily even know how to, I've written so much about trauma. I don't even necessarily know how to enter that space anymore. I'm done doing that. I, I'm like, um, I'm leaving that for Saturday therapy and I'm not writing about trauma anymore. Um, but for a very long time, I thought I'm just going to kind of excavate the thing that, that, I'm obsessed with and think about why I'm even returning to these memories and, and interrogate them. And if they make it into the book, that's fine. But if they don't, then I, you know, I wrote them down. And so much of what actually makes it into the book, so much of, you know, making art is interrogating why you're even writing this. Like, what is it that I've come to say? Um, rather than just, you know, here's a bunch of violence and this happened and that happened. It's more about, for me, it's more about what is it about this particular moment that's important that I want to talk about? It's much more about having a larger conversation than it is about just telling a personal story. It's a lot about what do I have to say about the larger world? Um, so, so when I was thinking about putting together the chapters or the essays that would become chapters in this book, I was thinking about um, the themes that I was returning to again and again, like sexual violence and what it is that I was even trying to say, like, why am I writing all these things? And returning to that question, what is it that I've come to say, kind of helped me to think of this as a book, as art, rather than just, you know, these aren't just diary entries. Uh, I have um, a question for Jakira. 
in um in formulating the uh, introduction and doing some research i was wondering about the ways in which um like in what ways do you think writing about uh womanhood within your fiction um shapes your own womanhood and then how does that perception of your of your own womanhood shape uh your fiction i was just curious about that um i try not to let my fiction necessarily change my perception of my own womanhood um i feel like the characters i'm working with when i'm writing fiction are made up of a lot of the people i've known um they tend to be kind of like mosaics of a bunch of people that I know, depending on what the story needs or what the novel needs. Um, I know that writing, the process of writing, I'm, I'm in the middle of a novel right now, the process of writing this book has forced me to listen to people more, to sit back and um, think about the how complicated people are, how people are not just good or just bad, how people are difficult and the people that um, are people who are capable of, you know, doing heroic things are also capable of doing terrible things and how to me, that's much more interesting people who are complicated and um, who are good and bad and not just one thing. But um, in terms of writing women, I think one of the things that attracts me most, why most of my main characters, they tend to be women, is because I'm interested in exploring um, the things that women aren't allowed to do or things women aren't allowed to say or the ways that um, we're not allowed about, we're not you know, allowed to talk about certain things um, or weren't, you know, it's 2020. But I, I think about my experience of growing up in my community and how, um, people had certain expectations of what, you know, what a Puerto Rican woman is and how my characters tend to be the opposite of that. And they tend to be rebellious. And um, so I think part of, part of what I bring to the characters is that um, I don't necessarily know that they've changed me. I guess we'll find out after the book comes out. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, I have a question from one of our associates, A, um, and she writes a lovely uh, compliment to you, Victoria, about um, Obit, the whole book, um, but I'm going to go down to the, to the end. Uh, she says, one of my favorite motifs of your book was how some things such as language and memory die and then die again. Could you speak to that choice of repetition? Um. You know, I think the word obsessive that Jakira used comes to mind. I have a very, very um, obsessive personality and it's, uh, it's a terrible quality in daily life. But um, in terms of writing, I think it can be interesting sometimes, but also can be terrible. Um, but it's, you know, I think, I think to answer it more seriously, I think language is slippery. And I think that, um, you know, I, I see another question in the chat box that asks, do you think aestheticizing death reduces its power? Well, I think that, um, you know, if you use language to aestheticize anything, anything will lose its power because there'll always be a distance, um, you know, metaphoric and, and physical distance between language and what its ability to describe in particular death. And that's kind of why I, think in retrospect, I was writing this book, you know, I was asking Jakira's question is, why am I writing this book? Because, you know, you, it's like I was trying to imagine a, an imaginary friend to see if I could explain to that friend what grief felt like at those at that particular moment, because, um, and a few of us were on a Zoom yesterday talking, we're having a conversation around grief and how grief is, I always say it's very asynchronous. So, um, and frankly, all emotions are asynchronous. You know, what you feel at a moment, you know, someone else could be right next to you and they're so excited um, and you're so depressed. And I don't know, so much of that is, that that's what makes being, I think, human so difficult and finding connection with other people so hard is because life is asynchronous and emotions are asynchronous. And in many ways we are asynchronous. And that's why sometimes we feel very desolate and alone, um, which is why I think writers write, you know, I think, um, you know, we're trying to find connection through 
language, but language always fails because it it's never able to describe what we're trying to describe. And, and so I think that repetition maybe, you know, I'm really talking out of my behind at this point, I don't really know, but I think it's probably just this inability to sort of, um, you know, kind of get to what I was trying to say. So then the, the motifs and the images just keep coming up again and again, because I've never really succeeded. You're always failing. Um, we have a question from Annette who asks, how do you push past or work through feelings of self-doubt and self-criticism when you sit down to write? I just never doubt myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard question. I mean, I think every person feels this all the time and it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are or where you are in your writing life. Um, it just, and it also depends what you're working on. And I think um, each poem might feel different. You know, I'm also, I'm right now I'm working on these hybrid things, essays, something, whatever they are. And it's been a really, really hard process. There are visual elements and I'm not a visual artist. And it's, I've had a, a tremendous amount of self-doubt um, to the point where I just wanted to pretty much abandon the whole project so many times. Um, and so I think it just depends on, um, you know, what you're, you're working on. And so when I feel that, that kind of self-doubt, I just start sending things to my friends. So um, I've even asked friends that I don't know super well if I feel like I, there's something about their work that they might be able to help me on this particular manuscript. I just did that with a poet, um, Monica Ong. She's a visual artist that I admire greatly and we're, we're friends, um, but we'd, we've never, we're not, we're not like exchanger friends, you know, that sort of like, I send you work, you send work kind of person, but we have become over the last just two weeks, we've been going back and forth um, with our, our manuscripts that we're working on. And so I think when you're feeling kind of any sort of self-doubt, self -doubt, a great way um, is to reach across the, the screen and ask people you know, um, friends or, or people you don't even know that well to, to help you. And, and, and you'd be amazed at how many people are, are willing, willing to do that and it can it could kind of confirm feelings that you're having about the manuscript but can it can also surprise you sometimes when people do like certain things about it and then one of my friends recently told me how much he hated it um, and that was really helpful too because um you know we went through all the reasons why and I've since cut 50 pages from the manuscript so um you know I think you just have to ask people for help is, is sort of how I, I personally deal with it. Thank you. I, I'll take that in, I'll take that into account. That's a great way. I never actually share my work. Self-doubt is something I seriously struggle with. I have the worst imposter syndrome ever. And so it takes a lot for me to send my work, even to, to, to close friends who have read my work. Um, I think one of the things that I tend to do is I write and I set it aside for a long time and return to it. Um, kind of trying to feel see it with fresh eyes with a new perspective after having written or read other things um and there's always something that feels when, when I return to writing there's always something that feels um dated or, or you know things I can cut um but I feel like once I've had some time away from the work and return to it I feel pretty confident that I'm seeing it with a new perspective. Um, I do think that it helps to have um, a vision, right? A vision of something that you know you want to accomplish so that when you return to it, um, you know whether or not you've accomplished that. But often for me, self-doubt has really a lot more to do with um, thinking about what other people will think about the work and I, I have to just quiet, you know, silence those voices that are not, that are not me, that are not, you know, thinking about my vision. So much of my self-doubt and, um, and my imposter syndrome has to do with what people I don't even know will say about the work. I think thinking about yourself and your audience, your real audience, who you're writing for and keeping them in mind, um, is something that has worked for me, thinking about who I'm writing for. And it's not, you know, not everyone will like your work and that's okay. Not, 
it won't resonate with everyone and that's perfectly fine. Um, but having developing a sense of vision, like your own vision for your work, um, I think that's really, really important. Thank you both. Um, on Ira's behalf, I'll let everyone know he had to slip off to teach actually. Um, I actually have our final question and I prepared you to in advance a little bit for this because uh, I didn't want you to be on the spot. But um, as you know, this is part of our In My Time and Narrative Space uh, series. And uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is bring our community together, be it Kenyan students, faculty, staff, Kenyan review readers, um, through um, shared readings and um, just shared exposure to things. So what I ask is that you um, leave us with a prompt that we, the audience can take and either do nothing with it or go and write something and share it with someone um, who might help us develop it further. Um, so what prompts would you leave us with tonight? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, so one of the chapters, one of the early chapters of my book in Ordinary Girls is called El Caserío, which is, um, I guess I'll tell you a very short story. Uh, it's about um, me as a young girl with a group of kids running around. And um, there's a, a guy who lives in our neighborhood and he's a Vietnam veteran. And at the time I was a child, didn't really know a lot of his story. Um, but he had PTSD and when we were kids, we went up to his house, his balcony and threw a bunch of rocks at him and threw rocks at him and taunted him until he came after us with a machete. And that moment for me, it felt like a very important moment because I mean, clearly a guy comes after you with a weapon and um, that stays with you, but I didn't really, think about why specifically until after I wrote the chapter and then really started thinking about what it was, um, why I was even writing about it. One of the things that happened is after that event happened with us, after he came after us with the machete, he, um, they found his body, they found him dead about a week or so later or a couple of weeks later. And I was thinking about the possibility of an alternate history. And this is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately when writing creative nonfiction, especially memoir, is this idea of um, alternate histories. And so I wrote a chapter and then at the end of the chapter, I ended with an alternate version of what if, asking myself, what if things had changed? What if things had gone differently? And I'll read you that paragraph. Um, it would be decades before I really thought about how much violence found its way into our childhood games, how it had been us kids who drove Weasel to attack, taunted him, targeted him, until he picked up that machete and walked out of his house, determined to hack us all to pieces. Or how he'd lived in that apartment with his wife, spent his days watching the seba, watching the leaves fall, the neighbor's bony backyard chickens strutting by with their pollitos, or who he was before they shipped him off to fight in someone else's war. How maybe he'd been the kind of man who stepped back in his apartment for a piece of stale bread to crumble and toss over the balcony for the birds. Or how else the story could have played out. In some other version, the girl is left behind by all the boys. She runs as fast as she can toward her abuela's house, but trips over her chancletas on the sidewalk. She falls or maybe she doesn't. She gets back up or maybe she never gets the chance. The boys run and run and run, the sun on their faces, the sour smell of caña burning somewhere in the distance until finally that front door opens, that front door open. In some other version, there is no front door. There is no girl. There is just Weasel alive. Um, and so this is me imagining an alternate history, an alternate series of events. Um, because I wanted readers to think about what if something else had happened? Um, what if I had fallen when he was running after us? And all these things, all these other things, because I wanted readers to think about the kind of community we were living in, that it was so common and that kids were running outside and also that we were living our, having our childhood moments right next to all this violence. 
Um, so this is a writing prompt on speculation. And I'm gonna give you a series of questions. Feel free to write them down on speculation. Um, first, tell me about a moment that changed everything. Who were you before this moment? Who were you after? What do you know now that you didn't know then? And finally, what if this moment had played out differently? And here's the most important part of the prompt. Imagine an alternate history, your alternate history, and write that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, I found this to be hard because normally when I give prompts, we spend a lot of time reading poems that sh are examples of those prompts. And so um, I just um, picked sort of two that sometimes I give, but without, we're not reading anything. So they're not as meaningful, but I was thinking that stories are really important right now. And, uh, you know, thinking of our histories and archival stories, and then the stories that are happening all around us every day that, um, you could, if you're writing a new poem, you could just start a poem simply with the word once. And I think that word once can really be really an open way to start a poem and just keep going and don't, don't edit yourself. Don't think of it as a poem, just start with the word once and just go where it, you, it takes you. If you're revising a poem, um, you know, just pick a number. Well, if your poem is 30, li 30 lines, just pick a random number between zero and 30 and wherever you land, um, start at that after that line and, and do the same thing. Start in, in with the word once and insert an artificial sort of like, I guess artificially insert a narrative into that particular poem to create a sort of natural sort of disjunct disjunctive kind of feeling. And then you may have to go back in and do some stitching. And with both of those, um, you have to include, um, sometimes I say things like you have to include a pair of sunglasses and you have to end with a question mark. Um, and another fun one that I use sometimes is based on Soma's Sharif's book, in the middle of it, there are all these erasure epistolary poems, write a letter to yourself or someone else, dear blank, and just write um, a letter and then get a Sharpie and then start doing an erasure of your own letter um, just for, for fun. And again, it's hard because normally we just, we do a lot of reading before I, I um, even deliver those prompts, but you can try those if you're interested. I don't know that you knew this, Victoria, but that actually is a great segue into collection number two, which I hope people will be reading um, for In My Time because there's a lot about erasure in that collection. Um, thank you both. That is, that is a wealth of, of uh, information and uh, a lot to take us away for the evening. Um, and thank you again for giving us your time. I mean, just on this in, on the screen, we represent three different time zones and um, I know the sun's rising in one and setting in the other. Um, but uh, yeah, we appreciate your evening with us. And thank you to the attendees who have um, joined us. Um, we'll be sending you an email tomorrow. And I'm going to try to add those prompts to the email and make sure that I've written them down correctly first. Um, and again, please, uh, everything that I mentioned earlier is still sitting over there on KenyanReview.org. I'm not going to type it in. I'll let you guys look for it yourself. Um, but yeah, have a wonderful evening. Take care. Be careful. Love the people around you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you Thank all. You. It was a pleasure Bye. to be with you. Good night, Shakira. Good night. <laughs>